Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the May 2023 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook of The Attitude of the Workers' Party to Religion by Lenin from 1909. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this piece was published in Proletary number 45, May 13, 1909, published here according to that text. The source is Lenin Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1973, Moscow, Volume 15, translated by Andrew Rothstein and Bernard Isaacs, HTML transcription and markup by R. Simbala, B. Baggins, D. Walters, and K. Goins. It's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, and thanks to Marxists Internet Archive, MIA, for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Go check them out at Marxists.org. Let's begin. Deputy Surkov's speech in the Duma, the Russian parliament, during the debate on the Senate estimates, and the discussion that arose within our Duma group when it considered the draft of this speech, have raised a question which is of extreme importance and urgency at this particular moment. An interest in everything connected with religion is undoubtedly being shown today by wide circles of, quote, society, and has penetrated into the ranks of intellectuals standing close to the working class movement as well as into certain circles of the workers. It is the absolute duty of social democrats to make a public statement of their attitude toward religion. Social democracy bases its whole world outlook on scientific socialism, i.e. Marxism. The philosophical basis of Marxism, as Marx and Engels repeatedly declared, is dialectical materialism, which has fully taken over the historical traditions of 18th century materialism in France and of Feuerbach, first half of the 19th century, in Germany. A materialism which is absolutely atheistic and positively hostile to all religion. Let us recall that the whole of Engels' anti deering which Marx read in manuscript, is an indictment of the materialist and atheist deering for not being a consistent materialist and for leaving loopholes for religion and religious philosophy. Let us recall that in his essay on Ludwig Feuerbach, Engels reproaches Feuerbach for combating religion not in order to destroy it, but in order to renovate it to invent a new, exalted religion, and so forth. Religion is the opium of the people. This dictum by Marx is the cornerstone of the whole Marxist outlook on religion. Marxism has always regarded all modern religions and churches, and each and every religious organization, as instruments of bourgeois reaction that serve to defend exploitation and to befuddle the working class. At the same time, Engels frequently condemned the efforts of people who desired to be, quote, more left or, quote, more revolutionary than the Social Democrats, to introduce into the program of the Workers' Party an explicit proclamation of atheism, in the sense of declaring war on religion. Commenting in 1874 on the famous manifesto of the Blancist fugitive communards who were living in exile in London, Engels called their vociferous proclamation of war on religion a piece of stupidity, and stated that such a declaration of war was the best way to revive interest in religion and to prevent it from really dying out. Engels blamed the Blancists for being unable to understand that only the class struggle of the working masses could by comprehensively drawing the widest strata of the proletariat into conscious and revolutionary social practice, really free the oppressed masses from the yoke of religion. Whereas to proclaim that war on religion was a political task of the Workers' Party was just anarchistic phrase-mongering. And in 1877, too, in his anti deering while ruthlessly attacking the slightest concessions made by Deering the philosopher to idealism and religion, Engels no less resolutely condemns Deering's pseudo-revolutionary idea that religion should be prohibited in socialist society. To declare such a war on religion, Engels says, is to out Bismarck Bismarck, i.e. to repeat the folly of Bismarck's struggle against the clericals, the notorious struggle for culture, Kulturkampf, i.e. the struggle Bismarck waged in the 1870s against the German Catholic Party, the Center Party, by means of a police persecution of Catholicism. By this struggle, Bismarck only stimulated the militant clericalism of the Catholics and only injured the work of real culture because he gave prominence to religious divisions rather than political divisions and diverted the attention of some sections of the working class and of the other democratic elements away from the urgent tasks of the class and revolutionary struggle to the most superficial and false bourgeois anti-clericalism. 
accusing the would-be ultra-revolutionary Deering of wanting to repeat Bismarck's folly in another form, Engels insisted that the Workers' Party should have the ability to work patiently at the task of organizing and educating the proletariat, which would lead to the dying out of religion, and not throw itself into the gamble of a political war on religion. This view has become part of the very essence of German social democracy, which, for example, advocated freedom for the Jesuits, their admission into Germany, and the complete abandonment of police methods of combating any particular religion. Quote, religion is a private matter. This celebrated point in the Erfurt program, 1891, summed up these political tactics of social democracy. These tactics have by now become a matter of routine. They have managed to give rise to a new distortion of Marxism in the opposite direction, in the direction of opportunism. This point in the Erfurt program has come to be interpreted as meaning that we social democrats, our party, consider religion to be a private matter, that religion is a private matter for us as social democrats, for us as a party. Without entering into a direct controversy with this opportunist view, Engels in the 90s, 1890s, deemed it necessary to oppose it resolutely in a positive and not a polemical form. To wit, Engels did this in the form of a statement, which he deliberately underlined, that social democrats regard religion as a private matter in relation to the state, but not in relation to themselves, not in relation to Marxism, and not in relation to the Workers' Party. Such is the external history of the utterances of Marx and Engels on the question of religion. To people with a slapdash attitude towards Marxism, to people who cannot or will not think, this history is a skein of meaningless Marxist contradictions and waverings, a hodgepodge of, quote, consistent atheism and, quote, sops to religion, unprincipled wavering between a revolutionary war on God and a cowardly desire to play up to religious workers, a fear of scaring them away, etc., etc., the literature of the anarchist phrasemongers contains plenty of attacks on Marxism in this vein. But anybody who is able to treat Marxism at all seriously, to ponder over its philosophical principles and the experience of international social democracy, will readily see that the Marxist tactics in regard to religion are thoroughly consistent and were carefully thought out by Marx and Engels, and that what dilettantes or ignoramuses regard as wavering is but a direct and inevitable deduction from dialectical materialism. It would be a profound mistake to think that the seeming, quote, moderation of Marxism in regard to religion is due to supposed tactical considerations, the desire not to scare away anybody and so forth. On the contrary, in this question too, the political line of Marxism is inseparably bound up with its philosophical principles. Marxism is materialism. As such, it is as relentlessly hostile to religion as was the materialism of the 18th century encyclopedists, or the materialism of Feuerbach. This is beyond doubt. But the dialectical materialism of Marx and Engels goes further than the encyclopedists and Feuerbach, for it applies the materialist philosophy to the domain of history, to the domain of the social sciences. We must combat religion. That is the ABC of all materialism, and consequently of Marxism. But Marxism is not a materialism which has stopped at the ABC. Marxism goes further. It says, we must know how to combat religion, and in order to do so, we must explain the source of faith in religion among the masses in a materialist way. The combating of religion cannot be confined to abstract ideological preaching, and it must not be reduced to such preaching. It must be linked up with the concrete practice of the class movement, which aims at eliminating the social roots of religion. Why does religion retain its hold on the backward sections of the town proletariat, on broad sections of the semi-proletariat, and on the mass of the peasantry. Because of the ignorance of the people, replies the bourgeois progressist, the radical, or the bourgeois materialist. And so, down with religion and long live atheism, the dissemination of atheist views is our chief task. The Marxist says this is not true, that it is a superficial view, the view of narrow bourgeois uplifters. It does not explain the roots of religion profoundly enough. It explains them not in a materialist, but in an idealist way. In modern capitalist countries, these roots are mainly social. The deepest root of religion today is the socially downtrodden condition of the working masses and their apparently complete helplessness in face of the blind forces of capitalism, which every day and every hour inflicts upon ordinary working people the most horrible suffering and the most savage torment, a thousand times more severe than those inflicted by extraordinary events such as wars, earthquakes, etc. Fear made the gods. Fear of the blind force of capital blind because it cannot be foreseen by the masses of the people, a force which at every step in the life of the proletarian and small proprietor threatens to inflict and does inflict, 
quote, sudden, quote, unexpected, quote, accidental ruin, destruction, pauperism, prostitution, death from starvation, such is the root of modern religion, which the materialist must bear in mind first and foremost if he does not want to remain an infant school materialist. No educational book can eradicate religion from the minds of masses who are crushed by capitalist hard labor and who are at the mercy of the blind destructive forces of capitalism until those masses themselves learn to fight this root of religion, fight the rule of capital in all its forms, in a united, organized, planned, and conscious way. Does this mean that educational books against religion are harmful or unnecessary? No, nothing of the kind. It means that social democracy's atheist propaganda must be subordinated to its basic task, the development of the class struggle of the exploited masses against the exploiters. This proposition may not be understood, or at least not immediately understood, by one who has not pondered over the principles of dialectical materialism, i.e., the philosophy of Marx and Engels. How is that, he will say? Is ideological propaganda, the preaching of definite ideas, the struggle against that enemy of culture and progress which has persisted for thousands of years, religion, to be subordinated to the class struggle, i.e. the struggle for definite practical aims in the economic and political field? This is one of those current objections to Marxism which testify to a complete misunderstanding of Marxian dialectics. The contradiction which perplexes these objectors is a real contradiction in real life i.e., a dialectical contradiction, not a verbal or invented one. To draw a hard and fast line between the theoretical propaganda of atheism, i.e., the destruction of religious beliefs among certain sections of the proletariat, and the success, the progress, and the conditions of the class struggle of these sections, is to reason undialectically, to transform a shifting and relative boundary into an absolute boundary. It is forcibly to disconnect what is indissolubly connected in real life. Let us take an example. The proletariat in a particular region and in a particular industry is divided, let's assume, into an advanced section of fairly class-conscious social democrats, Marxists, who are of course atheists, and rather backward workers who are still connected with the countryside and with the peasantry, and who believe in God, go to church, or are even under the direct influence of the local priest, who, let's suppose, is organizing a Christian labor union. Let us assume, furthermore, that the economic struggle in this locality has resulted in a strike. It is the duty of a Marxist to place the success of the strike movement above everything else, vigorously to counteract the division of the workers in this struggle into atheists and Christians, vigorously to oppose any such division. Atheist propaganda in such circumstances may be both unnecessary and harmful, not from the Philistine fear of scaring away the backward sections, of losing a seat in the elections, and so on, but out of consideration for the real progress of the class struggle, which in the conditions of modern capitalist society will convert Christian workers to social democracy and to atheism a hundred times better than bald atheist propaganda on its own. Comment, this is absolutely true. Without a strong labor movement, you are never going to have a strong socialist movement. The one is a prerequisite for the other. The proletariat must be organized and must be aware of its own strength when organized. Now, unions themselves are not socialism, do not necessarily lead directly to socialism. Sometimes they can have kind of a social chauvinist position, which does not take on capitalism in any kind of a revolutionary way. However, in order to build that revolutionary consciousness beyond just trade union consciousness, you do need the union first in a country that is mainly proletarian. So yeah, you don't want to break up the successful union drive by deciding that that's the time to pit Christians versus atheists and make the struggle over religious ideology the main thing. It clearly is not at that time. That said, anybody who becomes a communist, understand, this is your future. Adopting a scientific worldview that bases beliefs on evidence, not faith, that is able to go the distance in the most profound revolution in the history of the world, by adopting the view, as Marx said, that man is the highest essence for man, in other words, we're all we've got, and if we don't do it, it's not going to get done, that goes hand in hand with being highly class conscious and a scientific socialist. However, it does not take that realization and that understanding and that worldview to start to engage in successful class struggle, which again can raise class consciousness and take you out of that slave mentality of which religion is a part. So that's where class consciousness takes you. And if you're a communist, I mean, it's intrinsic to being a communist that you have a high degree of class consciousness. Well, this is a given. They're inseparable. 
So anyone trying to explicitly drag religion into their, quote, communism is a complete charlatan. The communist position is science and therefore atheism. But even more than this, the communist position is one of class struggle waged with the materialist understanding of society. To the class-conscious workers who have raised their heads enough against all of the reactionary propaganda that they have already questioned religion and maybe even become atheist, we welcome you. You are headed in the right direction. But the main thing that we need to do is help the masses to rise up against their exploiters and all of the lies that those exploiters tell them ideologically to help keep them in that place, including religion. So while we put out atheist propaganda because it is fundamental to the scientific worldview, we're also not going to hold up the class struggle over that. But again, communists preaching religion, or even not being sufficiently critical of it in our communications with other communists, other people with high degrees of class consciousness, are charlatans, liars, manipulators, distorters of what it means to be a Marxist, a scientific socialist, a materialist. As Marx wrote back in 1843, the foundation of irreligious criticism is man makes religion, religion does not make man. Religion is indeed the self-consciousness and self-esteem of man who has either not yet won through to himself or has already lost himself again. This state and this society produce religion, which is an inverted consciousness of the world because this is an inverted world. The struggle against religion is therefore indirectly the struggle against that world whose spiritual aroma is religion. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is the demand for their real happiness. To call on them to give up their illusions about their condition is to call on them to give up a condition that requires illusions. The criticism of religion is therefore in embryo, the criticism of that veil of tears of which religion is the halo. Quoting from the same document, Introduction to a Contribution to the Critique of Hegel's Philosophy of Right by Marx, the criticism of religion is the prerequisite of all criticism, and ends with the teaching that man is the highest essence for man, hence with the categoric imperative to overthrow all relations in which man is a debased, enslaved, abandoned, despicable essence. So no doubt, religion is a symptom of the suffering and exploitation of class society. We absolutely want to abolish that. It has no place being promoted by people trying to overthrow the exploitation-based set of social relations and build a world free of exploitation in its place. Religion will not be a part of that world without exploitation because religion is that mental narcotic given to the exploited so that they can bear their exploitation so that they can continue to be exploited. Those of us in this society of exploitation who have already come to some of these realizations and have learned to cast aside those false promises of religion in order to make a play for real liberation, real happiness, real satisfaction, absolutely need to encourage others along the same path. But as that path is the path of class struggle, you obviously don't want to do it in a way that hurts the class struggle. But you also can't conceal that Marxism and atheism are inseparably linked. So this channel, Socialism for All, is aimed at communists and the advanced masses, people who are already there or most of the way there. And I will tell you, I see way too many people fudging this question of religion and atheism. Among communists, it is non-negotiable. So that's why we're so direct about it. This isn't a popular channel. We have 15,000 subscribers right now. This is aimed at people who are already in the left, have already participated in campaigns, have already a fair degree of class consciousness and are looking to take those next steps of actually learning Marxism and doing some work, maybe preparing to join a party or something like that. You are in the more advanced sections of the working class, and so we're going to speak frankly on this channel with that audience in mind. If you're not capable of handling that, then maybe you're in the wrong place, and I would encourage you to come back when you are ready, when you have seen this truth for yourself, because it is true. As Lenin said, it is a Philistine view that you can't talk about these things because it's going to, quote, scare away the workers or whatever. Bullshit. If that is your view, then this channel is hostile towards you. Sorry, but that's the way it is. Continuing, to preach atheism at such a moment, 
during a pitched union struggle, and in such circumstances would only be playing into the hands of the priest and the priests, who desire nothing better than that the division of the workers according to their participation in the strike movement should be replaced by their division according to their belief in God. Comment. And of course the priest and the priest put all their energy into that, and a lot of times it is successful, and that is actually the division that shakes out, you know, their reactionary propaganda tends to be very persuasive. They tell people that they're going to go to hell and give them all kinds of horrible threats if they go against what the religious teachings are saying. You know, they get a lot of obedience out of that, and it's powerful. It works. That's why they do it, at least under certain circumstances. And we just have to do our best to counter it. But sometimes our best isn't good enough for particular circumstances. It really is up to the masses in the end. And if things don't go our way, then we have to wait for next time, analyze our successes and failures, and then try again. Continuing, an anarchist who preached war against God at all costs would be in effect helping the priests and the bourgeoisie, as the anarchists always do help the bourgeoisie in practice. A Marxist must be a materialist, i.e. an enemy of religion, but a dialectical materialist, i.e. one who treats the struggle against religion not in an abstract way, not on the basis of remote, purely theoretical, never-varying preaching, but in a concrete way, on the basis of the class struggle which is going on in practice and is educating the masses more and better than anything else could. A Marxist must be able to view the concrete situation as a whole, must always be able to find the boundary between anarchy and opportunism. This boundary is relative, shifting and changeable, but it does exist. And he must not succumb either to the abstract, verbal, but in reality empty, quote, revolutionism of the anarchist, or to the philistinism and opportunism of the petty bourgeois or liberal intellectual, who boggles at the struggle against religion, forgets that this is their duty, reconciles themselves to belief in God, and is not guided by the interests of the class struggle, but by the petty and mean consideration of offending nobody, repelling nobody, and scaring nobody, by this sage rule, live and let live, etc., etc., it's from this angle that all side issues bearing on the attitude of social democrats to religion should be dealt with. For example, the question is often brought up whether a priest can be a member of the social democratic party or not, and this question is usually answered in an unqualified affirmative, the experience of the European social democratic parties being cited as evidence. But this experience was the result not only of the application of the Marxist doctrine to the workers' movement, but also of the special historical conditions in Western Europe, which are absent in Russia. We will say more about these conditions later. So that an unqualified affirmative answer in this case is incorrect. It cannot be asserted once and for all that priests cannot be members of the Social Democratic Party, but neither can the reverse rule be laid down. If a priest comes to us to take part in our common political work and conscientiously performs party duties without opposing the program of the party, he may be allowed to join the ranks of the Social Democrats. For the contradiction between the spirit and principles of our program and the religious convictions of the priest would, in such circumstances, be something that concerned him alone, his own private contradiction, and a political organization cannot put its members through an examination to see if there is no contradiction between their views and the party program. But of course, such a case might be a rare exception even in Western Europe, while in Russia it's altogether improbable. And if, for example, a priest joined the Social Democratic Party and made it his chief and almost sole work actively to propagate religious views in the party, it would unquestionably have to expel him from its ranks. We must not only admit workers who preserve their belief in God into the Social Democratic Party, but must deliberately set out to recruit them. We are absolutely opposed to giving the slightest offense to their religious convictions, but we recruit them in order to educate them in the spirit of our program, and not in order to permit an active struggle against it. We allow freedom of opinion within the party, but to certain limits, determined by freedom of grouping. We are not obliged to go hand in hand with active preachers of views that are repudiated by the majority of the party. Another example. Should members of the Social Democratic Party be censured all alike under all circumstances for declaring socialism is my religion, that's funny, and for advocating views in keeping with this declaration? No. The deviation from Marxism, and consequently from socialism, is here indisputable, but the significance of the deviation, and this is why I laughed, its relative importance, so to speak, may vary with circumstances. It's one thing when an agitator or a person addressing the workers speaks in this way in order to make himself better understood, as an introduction to his subject, in order to present his views more vividly in terms to which the backward masses are most accustomed. 
It's another thing when a writer begins to preach God-building or God-building socialism in the spirit, for example, of our Lunacharsky and company. While in the first case, censure would be mere carping or even inappropriate restriction of the freedom of the agitator, of his freedom in choosing pedagogical methods, in the second case, party censure is necessary and essential. For some, the statement socialism is a religion is a form of transition from religion to socialism. For others, it is a form of transition from socialism to religion. Let us now pass to the conditions which in the West gave rise to the opportunist interpretation of the thesis, religion is a private matter. Of course, a contributing influence are those general factors which give rise to opportunism as a whole, like sacrificing the fundamental interests of the working class movement for the sake of momentary advantages. The party of the proletariat demands that the state should declare religion a private matter, but does not regard the fight against the opium of the people, the fight against religious superstitions, etc., as a private matter. The opportunists distort the question to mean that the Social Democratic Party regards religion as a private matter. But in addition to the usual opportunist distortion, which was not made clear at all in the discussion within our Duma group when it was considering the speech on religion, there are special historical conditions which have given rise to the present day, and if one may so express it, excessive indifference on the part of the European Social Democrats to the question of religion. These conditions are of a twofold nature. First, the task of combating religion is historically the task of the revolutionary bourgeoisie, and in the West, this task was to a large extent performed or tackled by bourgeois democracy in the epoch of its revolutions or its assaults upon feudalism and medievalism. Both in France and in Germany, there is a tradition of bourgeois war on religion, and it began long before socialism, the encyclopedists, Feuerbach. In Russia, because of the conditions of our bourgeois democratic revolution, this task, too, falls almost entirely on the shoulders of the working class. Petty bourgeois or narodnik populist democracy in our country has not done too much in this respect, as the new-fledged Black Hundred Cadets, or Cadet Black Hundreds of Vecchi think, but rather too little in comparison with what was done in Europe. Footnote here, Vecchi, or Landmarks, was a cadet collection of articles by N. Berdayev, S. Bulgakov, P. Struve, M. Hershenzon, and other representatives of the counter-revolutionary liberal bourgeoisie published in Moscow in 1909. In their articles on the Russian intelligentsia, these writers tried to discredit the revolutionary democratic traditions of the best representatives of the Russian people, including Belinsky and Chernyshevsky. They vilified the revolutionary movement of 1905 and thanked the Tsarist government for having, quote, with its bayonets and jails, saved the bourgeoisie from, quote, the popular wrath. The writers called upon the intelligentsia to serve the autocracy. Lenin compared the program of the Vecchi Symposium in point of both philosophy and journalism with that of the Black Hundred newspaper, Moskovskia Vedomosti, calling the symposium, quote, an encyclopedia of liberal renegacy, quote, nothing but a flood of reactionary mud poured on democracy, unquote. And for those who don't know the Black Hundreds, this was an extreme reactionary, monarchist, anti-Jewish group. This was before the age of fascism proper, but a lot of similarities, arch-reactionaries. Back to the main text. On the other hand, the tradition of bourgeois war on religion has given rise in Europe to a specifically bourgeois distortion of this war by anarchism, which, as the Marxists have long explained time and again, takes its stand on the bourgeois world outlook, in spite of all the, quote, fury of its attacks on the bourgeoisie. The anarchists and Blancists in the Latin countries, Most, who incidentally was a pupil of Deering and his ilk in Germany, the anarchists in Austria in the 1880s, all carried revolutionary phrase-mongering in the struggle against religion to a knee plus ultra, ultimate high point. It is not surprising that, compared with the anarchists, the European Social Democrats now go to the other extreme. This is quite understandable and to a certain extent legitimate, but it would be wrong for us Russian Social Democrats to forget the special historical conditions of the West. Secondly, in the West, after the national bourgeois revolutions were over, after more or less complete religious liberty had been introduced, the problem of the democratic struggle against religion had been pushed historically so far into the background by the struggle of bourgeois democracy against socialism that the bourgeois governments deliberately tried to draw the attention of the masses away from socialism by organizing a quasi-liberal offensive against clericalism. 
Such was the character of the Kulturkampf in Germany and of the struggle of the bourgeois republicans against clericalism in France. Bourgeois anti-clericalism, as a means of drawing the attention of the working class masses away from socialism, this is what preceded the spread of the modern spirit of indifference to the struggle against religion among the social democrats in the West. And this again is quite understandable and legitimate because social democrats had to counteract bourgeois and Bismarckian anti-clericalism by subordinating the struggle against religion to the struggle for socialism. So comment here, this is quite an important point I think. The Marxists, in other words, because the bourgeoisie had moved back into the space of anti-clericalism, wanted to recontextualize the struggle against religion in terms of the broader struggle against capitalism. But you can't go too far. I feel like this tendency pervades today, although in an even less principled form, where just anything the bourgeoisie says is automatically wrong. That's not the case. So is it wrong to be you know, anti-clerical, anti-religion? No. But the bourgeoisie is going to do it in a way which tries to benefit capitalism. So a lot of people fall for this kind of knee-jerk contrarianism, um, getting confused, for example, by like corporate pride campaigns, where they look and see, oh, look, a large corporation, which, you know, exploits me, is being nice in a superficial way to LGBTQ plus people. Therefore, it's, I guess, revolutionary to just do the exact opposite. Start being mean to LGBTQ plus people and hating them. I'm very smart. I will just do the exact opposite of what the bourgeoisie appear to be doing, even though it's usually superficial and just for their own shallow, limited benefit, while in reality, forms of oppression go on despite this PR campaign. And that's where you find yourself eventually linking arms with libertarians and the moral majority and other extreme right-wingers. And if you have any sense, then you figure out, ooh, I guess contrarianism, you know, just doing the exact opposite of what the bourgeoisie does, sometimes blows up in your face because it's, you know, contrarianism is not a substitute for critical thinking. Wow, like it's almost not an escape from being manipulated. Anyway, continuing. In Russia, conditions are quite different. The proletariat is the leader of our bourgeois democratic revolution. Its party must be the ideological leader in the struggle against all attributes of medievalism, including the old official religion, and every attempt to refurbish it or make out a new or different case for it, etc. Therefore, while Engels was comparatively mild in correcting the opportunism of the German Social Democrats, who were substituting for the demand of the Workers' Party that the state should declare religion a private matter, the declaration that religion is a private matter for the Social Democrats themselves, and for the Social Democratic Party, it is clear that the importation of this German distortion by the Russian opportunists would have merited a rebuke a hundred times more severe by Engels. By declaring from the Duma rostrum that religion is the opium of the people, our Duma group acted quite correctly, and thus created a precedent which should serve as a basis for all utterances by Russian Social Democrats on the question of religion. Should they have gone further and developed the atheist argument in greater detail? We think not. This might have brought the risk of the political party of the proletariat exaggerating the struggle against religion. It might have resulted in obliterating the distinction between the bourgeois and the socialist struggle against religion. The first duty of the social democratic group in the Black Hundred Duma has been discharged with honor. The second duty, and perhaps the most important for social democrats, namely to explain the class role of the church and the clergy in supporting the Black Hundred government and the bourgeoisie in its fight against the working class, has also been discharged with honor. Of course, very much more might be said on this subject, and the social democrats in their future utterances will know how to amplify Comrade Surkov's speech. But still, his speech was excellent, and its circulation by all party organizations is the direct duty of our party. The third duty was to explain in full detail the correct meaning of the proposition, so often distorted by the German opportunists that, quote, religion is a private matter. This, unfortunately, Comrade Surkov did not do. It is all the more regrettable because in the earlier activity of the Duma group, a mistake had been committed on this question by Comrade Belusov, and was pointed out at the time by Proletary. The discussion in the Duma group shows that the dispute about atheism has screened from it the question of the proper interpretation of the celebrated demand that religion should be proclaimed a private matter. We shall not blame Comrade Surkov alone for this error of the entire Duma group. More, we shall frankly admit that the whole party is at fault here, for not having sufficiently elucidated this question and not having sufficiently prepared the minds of social democrats to understand Engel's remark 
leveled against the German opportunists. The discussion in the Duma group proves that there was in fact a confused understanding of the question, and not at all any desire to ignore the teachings of Marx. We are sure that the error will be corrected in future utterances of the group. We repeat that on the whole, Comrade Surkov's speech was excellent and should be circulated by all the organizations. In its discussion of this speech, the Duma group demonstrated that it is fulfilling its social democratic duty conscientiously. It remains to express the wish that reports on discussions within the Duma group should appear more often in the party press, so as to bring the group and the party closer together, to acquaint the party with the difficult work being done within the group, and to establish ideological unity in the work of the party and the Duma group. And that's the end of the audiobook. So I made a lot of comments in this already. I just want to make one more. In the section where Lenin was talking about the possibility of censuring people for declaring, quote, socialism is my religion, and how there are different possible meanings of that, how some of them would not be as bad as others, and so on, one of the more permissible forms Lenin considered was when an agitator or person addressing the workers speaks in quasi-religious terms in order to make himself better understood as an introduction to a subject in order to present his views more vividly in terms to which the backward masses are most accustomed. And he basically called censure of that carping. I think that historical circumstances today in 2023 versus 1909, there is a different context where it might still be permissible to a certain extent, but I think that there is more cause for caution now perhaps than there was back then. Specifically, we have seen since that time various anti-Marxist, anti-communist forces try to do some kind of Christian social democracy thing. In other words, anti-revolutionary, anti-communist, but uses Christianity to try to sell people on the idea of fighting for more equality. So some people got angry when a few live streams ago, I pretty heavily criticized Martin Luther King Jr. for doing this exact thing. In the last speech that he gave, and it was in a relatively recent live stream, I think somewhere in the 90s or maybe late 80s as far as the live stream number. In the speech, he invoked Christian parables to try to explain to the audience why a fight for more equality, even basically describing a revolution while stating that he was anti-communist, naming Trotsky, Lenin, and others by name, um, describing a revolution without the revolution. He's like, we need a complete change of society from the ground up but I don't take my principles from Marx and Lenin and Trotsky. No, I don't, etc. I think that you do have to be on guard against this kind of thing. In 1909, when the only culture that rural peasants got literally was the Bible, um, you know, maybe that's one thing as a introduction to the concept of fighting for more equality and how it's moral, etc. We live in a different world today, at least in the United States. And again, that's primarily the audience I'm talking to, although this applies across a lot of the world as well. I mean, TV has been a thing for a while, comic books, popular culture. There are so many other things you can draw on that people have in their moral vocabulary, even, how about this for a radical concept, the actually existing history of socialism as we saw it in the 20th century. There are some real examples there. There are examples from the labor movement, even in countries that didn't have a revolution. There are other things to draw on other than Christianity or other types of religious messaging. True, they may not have the sort of moral pull and influence that the religious indoctrination may have. But again, my note would just to be wary because we have seen repeatedly anti-communist efforts come in in the name of a sort of Christian socialism or something like that which is of dubious origins, and I don't know that it's going to take you that far. I mean, it's very commonplace to say, uh, you know, like in the example of Christianity in the U.S., the Republican Party, the most extreme reactionaries, are very content to claim to be Christians while not espousing really any form of kindness towards anyone remotely different from them, for example. To be the most classist, racist, sexist, heterosexist people in society. The thing that I see that's most effective there is pointing out the hypocrisy as a way of turning people off from that. But I don't think it leads you much further than that on its own. So in other words, what may have been mere carping in 1909, I do think that we have more reason to be suspicious of in an increasingly secularized world with many other sources of culture and parables to draw from. When people do this, I think that it tends to be more from 
a place of trying to play to the most reactionary, um, and it tends to be more for fascist movements, trying to rally the most reactionary masses, the most backward sections of the masses in bigotry and nationalism and so on, and then just sort of calling it somehow socialist or revolutionary or whatever. To me, I just haven't really seen this work to any positive end. It's sort of like the debate over patriotism. Oh, we can reclaim patriotism. That doesn't really work, though. I mean, it's like you saw it during, for example, the Bush-Cheney years when there were massive right-wing changes introduced, the launching of a large-scale war, massive domestic changes. All of this was done in sort of the name of protecting the homeland and patriotism. And then you got the sort of uh, dissent is patriotic counter-narrative. Okay, it works to a certain extent, but how far does it take you? I think not very far. It's a way, again, to separate some people from the extreme reactionaries. But where they go from there is really an open question. And again, do the religious parables really serve as the quickest and most concrete path towards becoming more class conscious and doing the kind of practical concrete things that we want to see more workers doing? All right, we're going to leave it there. Thanks for listening. Thanks to the patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. Help me pay some bills. I do spend a lot of time on this channel. It's time that I can't spend on other wage work and money earning pursuits. That support is crucial. We don't run ads on the channel. It's a non-commercial channel. So really appreciate the patron support. If you like the channel, thank me for doing it. But of course, thank the patrons for that support. Also, thanks to everybody who supports the channel through liking, subscribing, commenting, and other forms of engagement, which help to boost the channel. Thanks also to people who send me reading ideas, story ideas, research ideas, interesting current events. All of that helps the channel to be what it is as well. And remember that the class struggle occurs in real life. This is a YouTube channel. I'm studying Marxism. You're studying along with me. But the struggle happens out there in the real world, not in this series of tubes we call the internet, whose flow is guided by the mighty algorithm. So touch grass, get out there in the world, find political parties, labor unions, tenant unions, other forms of class struggle going on in your area, network with them, get to know them, let them get to know you, and either there's a good project already going that you can get involved with and help to build in your area, or you at least might meet some people who have the experience and knowledge to start the project that needs to happen. The U.S. left has been badly suppressed for a long time. We really need to lead a resurgence now. Capitalism is not getting better on its own, and we have to build the movement that can strike in a meaningful way the next time capital has a major point of vulnerability, which is only a matter of time. Until then, keep learning, solidarity, and we'll see you in the next video.